In this video, we're going to talk about what exactly was mercantilism, and was it a viable form of early capitalism before what we consider capitalism to be today. So hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so you stay up to date on when new videos come out. Mercantilism became the dominant school of economic thought in Europe throughout the late Renaissance and the early modern period, roughly from the 15th to the 18th centuries. Evidence of mercantilistic practices appeared in early modern Venice, Genoa, and Pisa regarding control of the Mediterranean trade in bullion. However, the empiricism of the Renaissance, which first began to quantify large-scale trade accurately, marked mercantilism's birth as a codified school of economic theory. The Italian economist and mercantilist Antonio Serra is considered to have written one of the first treaties on political theory with his 1613 work, A Short Treatise on the Wealth and the Poverty of Nations. Mercantilism in its simplest form is bullionism, yet mercantilist writers emphasize the circulation of money and reject hoarding. Their emphasis on monetary metals accords with current ideas regarding the money supply such as the stimulative effect of a growing money supply. Fiat money and floating exchange rates have since rendered specie concerns irrelevant. In time, industrial policy supplanted the heavy emphasis on money, accompanied by a shift in focus from the capacity to carry on wars to promoting general prosperity. Mature neo-mercantilism theory recommends selective high tariffs for infant industries or the promotion of mutual growth of countries through national industrial specialization. England began the first large-scale and integrative approach to mercantilism during the Elizabethan era, 1558-1603. An early statement on national balance of trade appeared in Discourse of the Commonwealth of this Realm of England, 1549 which quoted, We must always take heed that we buy no more from the strangers than we sell them, for so should we impoverish ourselves and enrich them. The period featured various but often disjointed efforts by the court of Queen Elizabeth, reigning from 1558 to 1603, to develop a naval and merchant fleet capable of challenging the Spanish stronghold on trade and of the expanding the growth of bullion at home. Queen Elizabeth promoted the Trade and Navigation Acts in Parliament and issued orders to her navy for the protection and promotion of English shipping. Her efforts organized national resources sufficiently in the defense of England against the far larger and more powerful Spanish Empire, and in turn paved the foundation for establishing a global empire in the 19th century. Authors noted most for establishing the English mercantilistic system included Gerard de Manieres and Thomas Munn, who first articulated the Elizabethan system which Josiah Child then developed further. Numerous French authors helped cement French policy around the mercantilistic system in the 17th century. Jean-Baptiste Gobert best articulated this French mercantilism. French economic policy liberalized greatly under Napoleon, who was in power from 1799 to 1814-1815. Many nations applied the theory, notably France, King Louis XIV, reigned from 1643 to 1715, allowed the guidance of Jean-Baptiste Colbert, his controller general of finances from 1665 to 1683. It was determined that the state should rule in the economic realm as it did in the diplomatic, and that the interests of the state as identified by the king were superior to those of merchants and of everyone else. Mercantilist economic policies aimed to build up the state, especially in an age of ongoing warfare, and theories charged the state with looking for ways to strengthen the economy and to weaken foreign adversaries. In Europe, academic belief in mercantilism began to fade in the late 18th century after the British seized control of the Mughal Bengal, and further trading nations and the establishment of the British India through the activities of the East India Company, in light of the arguments of Adam Smith and of the classical economists. The British Parliament's repeal of the Corn Laws under Robert Peel in 1846 symbolized the emergence of free trade as an alternative system. So what was the theory behind mercantilism? Most of the European economists who wrote between 1500 and 1750 are today generally considered mercantilists. The bulk of what is commonly called mercantilist literature appeared in the 1620s in Great Britain. Adam Smith saw the English merchant Thomas Munn as a major creator of the mercantile system, especially in his published Treasure by Foreign Trade in 1664, which Adam Smith considered the manifesto of the movement. Perhaps the last major mercantilistic work was James Stewart's Principles of Political Economy, published in 1767. Mercantilist literature also extended beyond England. Italy and France also produced noted writers, including Italy's Giovanni Botero and Antonio Serra, and in France, Jean Bodin and Colbert. Themes also existed in writers from the German historical school from Liszt, 
as well as followers of the American system and the British free trade imperialism, thus stretching the system into the 19th century. However, many British writers, including Munn and Misaldin, were merchants, while many of the other writers from other countries were political officials. Beyond mercantilism as a way of understanding the wealth and the power of nations, Munn and Misaldin are noted for their viewpoints on a wide range of economic matters. Now, the Austrian lawyer and scholar Philip Wilhelm von Hornrich, one of the pioneers of cameralism, detailed a nine-point program of what he deemed effective national economy in his Austria overall, if she only will, of 1684, which comprehensively sums up the tenets of mercantilism. Number one, that every little bit of a country's soil be utilized for agriculture, mining, and manufacturing. Number two, that all raw materials found in the country be used in domestic manufacture, since finished goods have a higher value than raw materials. Number three, that a large working population be encouraged to work. Number four, that all exports of gold and silver be prohibited and all domestic money be kept in circulation. Number five, that all imports of foreign goods be discouraged as much as possible. Number six, that where certain imports are indispensable that they be obtained at first hand in exchange for other domestic goods instead of gold and silver. Number seven, that as much as possible, imports can be confined to raw materials that can be finished in the home country. Number eight, that opportunities be constantly sought for selling a country's surplus manufacturers to foreigners, so far as necessary for gold and silver. And number nine, that no importation be allowed if such goods are sufficiently and suitably supplied at home. Mercantilistic domestic policy was more fragmented than its trade policy. While Adam Smith portrayed mercantilism as supportive of strict controls over the economy, many of their supporters disagreed. The early modern era was one of the letters patent and the government imposed monopolies. Some mercantilists supported these, but others acknowledged the corruption and inefficiency of such systems. Many mercantilists also realized that the inevitable result of quotas and price ceilings were black markets. One notion that mercantilists were widely agreed upon was the need of economic oppression of the working population. Laborers and farmers were to live at the margins of subsistence. The goal was to maximize production with no concern for consumption. Extra money, free time, and education for the lower classes were seen to be inevitably lead to vice and laziness and would result in harm to the economy. The mercantilists saw a large population as a form of wealth that made possible the development of bigger markets and armies. Opposite to mercantilism was the doctrine of physiocracy, which predicted that mankind would outgrow its resources. The idea of mercantilism was to protect the markets as well as maintain agriculture and those who were dependent upon it. In essence, mercantilistic ideas were the dominant economic ideology of all of Europe in the early modern period, and most states embraced it to a certain degree. Mercantilism was centered in England and France, and it was in these states that mercantilistic policies were often made and acted. These policies followed a set number of guidelines. High tariffs, especially on manufactured goods. Forbidding colonies to trade with other nations. Monopolizing markets with staple ports. Banning the export of gold and silver, even for payments. Forbidding trade to be carried in foreign ships, as per example the Navigation Act. Subsidies on exports. Promoting manufacturing and industry through research or direct subsidies. Limiting wages maximizing the use of domestic resources, and restricting domestic consumption through non-tariff barriers to trade. Now, how did mercantilism end? Adam Smith and David Hume were the founding fathers of anti-mercantilistic thought. A number of scholars found important flaws with mercantilism long before Smith developed an ideology that would fully replace it. Critics like Hume, Dudley North, and John Locke undermined much of mercantilism and it steadily lost favor during the 18th century. In 1690, John Locke argued that prices vary in proportion to the quantity of money. Locke's second treatises also points towards the heart of the anti-mercantilistic critique, that the wealth of the world is not fixed, but is created by human labor. Mercantilists failed to understand the notion of absolute vantage and the comparative advantage and the benefit of trade. For instance, imagine that Portugal was a more efficient producer of wine than England. Yet in England, cloth could be produced more efficiently than in Portugal. Thus, in Portugal specialized in wine and England in cloth. Both states would end up better off if they traded. This is an example of the reciprocal benefits of trade. In modern economic theory, trade is not a zero-sum game of cutthroat competition because both sides can benefit from it. David Hume famously noted the impossibility of the mercantilist's goal of a constant positive balance of trade. As bullion flowed into one country, the supply would increase, and the value of bullion in that state would steadily decline relative to other goods. Conversely, in the state exporting bullion, 
its value would slowly rise. Eventually, it would no longer be cost effective to export goods from the higher priced country to the low priced country, and the balance of trade would reverse. Mercantilists fundamentally misunderstood this, long arguing that an increase in the money supply simply meant that everyone got richer. The importance placed on bullion was also a central target, even if many mercantilists had themselves begun to de-emphasize the importance of gold and silver. Adam Smith noted that at the core of the mercantilist system was the popular folly of confusing wealth with money, that bullion was just the same as any other commodity, and that there was no reason to give it any special treatment. The first school to completely reject mercantilism was the physiocrats, who developed their theories in France. Their theories also had several important problems, and the replacement of mercantilism did not come until Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations in 1776. This book outlined the basics of what is today known as classical economics. Smith spent a considerable portion of the book rebuting the arguments of the mercantilists, though often these are simplified or exaggerated versions of mercantilistic thought. Mercantilistic regulation were steadily removed over the course of the 18th century in Britain, and during the 19th century, the British government fully embraced free trade and Smith's laissez-faire economics. On the continent, the process was somewhat different. In France, economic control remained in the hands of the royal family, and mercantilism continued until the French Revolution. In Germany, mercantilism remained an important ideology in the 19th and early 20th century, when the historical school of economics was paramount. So. I'd love to get your thoughts on the video. What do you think of mercantilism? Should we bring it back? Is it better than this laissez-faire capitalism that we currently have today because of Adam Smith? Leave a comment down below and let's get a discussion started. And as always, take care of your money. Oh, and one last thing before you go. I created a course called Smart Money Parenting as a way to teach parents how to educate their kids about money. An early financial education is the foundation for wealth building. So give your kids a future they deserve. Use code MONEY20 at checkout to receive 20% off my master course. I'll leave a link to the course down below.